Okay, everyone. Good morning. My name is Anna Swardensky. It is 9.03 and we're going to go ahead and get underway with today's program. Uh, thank you for joining us for this morning's session on disaster volunteer management. Uh, let me get my next slide up. Um, by way of welcome and introductions, if you're joining us and you haven't yet done so, if you could please put your name and the organization you represent in our chat box, that way folks can know who's joining today. And if you wouldn't mind uh, changing your screen name as well to reflect your first name and um, the uh, name of your organization as well. And I didn't do so, so I'm gonna do that right now to show you. Um, and that way, if you do speak aloud or we have video cameras open, we know who's uh, in the session with us. So thank you for doing that housekeeping. In terms of our Zoom basics, we will encourage you to actively use the chat box uh, and enter in any questions, comments, or uh, additional information or expertise you might have to share with the group. Uh, we are running live transcript in two ways on our program. We are using Zoom live transcript, and that's a menu option in your control panel that allows you to pop out a full window of transcript and or run the subtitles along the bottom of your screen. We are also running Otter AI as a separate um, uh, artificial intelligence tool. It opens up a separate browser window. So if you would like to use that, feel free to do so. I am your access coordinator for today. So if you have any accessibility issues, please feel free to direct message me throughout today's program and I'll do my best to assist you. Um, one last housekeeping note, we are recording today's session. So we do ask if you have a comment or we have you speaking aloud, if you would, wouldn't mind turning on your video camera, uh, that would be wonderful. And with that, uh, why are we here? This session this morning is a part of our series of workshops for the Bay Area region that's funded by the Bay Area UWASI, which stands for the Urban Areas Security Initiative. And in particular, it is a um, part of what's called the Community Preparedness uh, series of set trainings that's offered around the 12 Bay Area counties. Cadre serves as the lead for the South Bay Hub, covering Monterey, Santa Cruz, San Benito, and Santa Clara counties. And so I'm going to move us forward because we have some really exciting speakers to share with you today. Uh, the objectives for today's session are to explore the challenges and benefits of disaster volunteer management, uh, look at lessons learned from our current and past disasters, and hear from a panel of speakers with lived experience working in this arena. Um, in terms of the agenda overview, we're wrapping up our welcome and introductions and um, why we're here. We're, I'm gonna cover just a couple of really basic slides, uh, slides with some basic information around disaster volunteers. And then we're going to go into our first panel um, and what we know from other experiences, other events beyond COVID. There'll be a Q&A opportunity and we'll close out our program right around 1030 with an opportunity for you to give us your feedback and our closing remarks. And so with that, um, if you'll keep your chat box window open, thank you, Araceli is our chair of our cadre board of directors and she's one of our speakers today and she'll uh, monitor the chat while I'm speaking in this first segment. So let's keep moving forward. Um, these are a couple of pictures from our session last year on this topic when we heard from the executive director of the Volunteer Center, Santa Cruz, and um, to quote Karen Delaney from Santa Cruz Volunteer Center, volunteers are a powerful force. Um, they can, spontaneous volunteers in particular, can be a driving force for tremendous work or an overwhelming and chaotic force. And so what we're hoping today is to help you harness the power of volunteer efforts and um, be able to take full advantage of the resources within each of our communities. So 
there's a couple of givens I want to um, highlight on volunteers and disasters. One, volunteers can't be stopped. We know when there are emergencies or disasters in our community that the need to respond is overwhelming from a lot of folks. And oftentimes in these events, there's also a shortage of labor. And so what we have seen most recently also is that social media and technology can really be a game changer. It will help in a lot of ways to connect our communities with one another and our needs, but it can also sometimes be overwhelming and a source of uh, challenge for our volunteer managers across our different programs. And I'm seeing some of our speakers heads nod with these comments. So, um, yeah, you know, there will be people who will step up in any event. And um, we do oftentimes encourage that folks pre-train or pre-register if they have a unique passion um, and they know what they want to do when their communities are in need. But even with that, uh, the pre-registered, pre-trained volunteers seldom meet the full need in a larger scale or catastrophic event. Um, so what does it take to manage uh, this wonderful force, we hope, uh, of volunteer resources? Uh, Karen shared with us last year that consistent and simple, frequent communication is key. Um, and that could be things like daily communication to help people understand why they are or are not being assigned to a particular volunteer opportunity. And um, it should be uh, communication that is in line with what people are seeing in the general media that will help to eliminate or alleviate confuse, confusion on what's needed after a disaster. Um, you can see that isolation and rapid deployment are um, often needed for high need and low skill kind of labor jobs. Just we need extra hands. That's what, uh, and you need to be prepared for kind of an onslaught of folks that might be willing to come out and help. But there's also a need for specialized and high need skills. And one of our speakers in particular is going to talk about this a little bit more today. And lastly, clear written instructions whenever possible and smart use of on the ground leaders um, in some type of a supervisory role is also key for uh, disaster volunteers. The next slide, um, I wanted the last one I wanted to cover before we get to our speakers panel is who should focus on spontaneous volunteers? Oh, pardon the dog in the background. Um, volunteer centers, if you have one, are a great place for communities. Really sorry about that. Um, other local options include United Way, um, faith-based coalitions, community-based volunteer organizations, and we have a number of them lined up to speak to you today. There's also a statewide um, program here in California uh, that was active during the COVID-19 um, and is around day to day as well. And it's California for all. I believe we do have a representative that was joining us. Um, she's not logged in as of yet that I can see in the participants window, but uh, Candace Aquino is also supposed to be here from California Volunteers if um, you have any questions about that. Whoopsie. Um, and lastly, um, you know, we want to mention that qualifications, uh, if you're going to be managing spontaneous volunteers, ideally you have a background in understanding volunteers, you have a robust communication capacity, good relations with your local county or city offices of emergency services or other departments that you need to coordinate with for volunteer efforts, and lastly, a simple system for engaging community volunteers in times of an emergency. And so with that, I did a quick check on my chat box. I'm not seeing any questions come in in the moment, so let's move right forward to our panel. 
Um, our first speaker this morning is Ashley Raggio. She joins us from Joint Venture Silicon Valley, who played a key role in standing up our volunteer program here in the South Bay last year. Ashley currently serves as the Deputy Director for the Building Back Better Initiative of Joint Venture Silicon Valley. Um, during the initial COVID-19 crisis, Ashley was working as the director of something called the Silicon Valley Talent Partnership, and it focused on facilitating pro bono volunteer projects with local companies and nonprofits or the private uh, public sector agencies. Uh, she's working on evolving these volunteer systems at Silicon Valley Strong. Um, or she, she did work in partnership with our Silicon Valley Council of Nonprofits in the city of San Jose uh, from the beginning of the pandemic and focused specifically on the engagement of skilled volunteers for a special project. So Ashley, I'm going to turn the microphone over to you and forward this on. Uh, just let me know when you're ready for slides to move forward. Thank you, Ashley. Great, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Happy Tuesday. Thank you for having me today. Uh, like Anna said, I'm at Joint Venture Silicon Valley. And as with so many people, my, my role has changed dramatically about 12 times since the onset of the pandemic. So what I am doing today is very much focused on recovery. And as Anna said, building back better with a focus on equity. Uh, in the South Bay Silicon Valley, uh, but my primary background and expertise is actually in volunteer back, uh, management and engagement. I've worked in the nonprofit in volunteer management. I have worked quite a bit in higher ed in service learning for student volunteer management. And also I worked for about four years in family volunteer, family volunteerism and getting more families to volunteer with their kids. So uh, if we can pop onto the next slide, at the onset of, oh, one back, sorry. At the onset of the pandemic, uh, what we were doing at Joint Venture and the Talent Partnership Initiative was matching corporate pro bono volunteer teams with larger strategic capacity building projects at nonprofits and public sector organizations. As soon as the pandemic hit, we realized we needed to pivot quickly, as did everyone else. And the, the real need we saw that we could meet is matching individual skilled volunteers to nonprofits or public sector agencies very quickly based on the requests that were coming in from those, from those organizations. We partnered with the Council of Nonprofits and Silicon Valley Strong, the city of San Jose, to create what you see as a, a pretty complicated on its surface, but, but it, it's pretty simple when it comes down to it, a system to get volunteers quickly to the places that we needed them. Nonprofits and, and other agencies were requesting their need for volunteers to the Council of Nonprofits. That was for primarily food distribution at the in the early days, but also for specific needs. There was a lot of I'll go into in a moment, um, needs for translation and a lot of human resources support given that uh, everything was switching to remote work and, and all those types of things. Those needs then would be matched through the volunteer applications that were coming in through the Silicon Valley Strong website, where the initial application was very much just sort of the basic information and whether people were uh, able to go to uh, in-person sites for food distribution. When we joined in, we said that there, we, you know, with Council of Nonprofits, we realized there was a need for these more specific individual volunteers to come in with their special skills or expertise and be matched to those needs as well. And so we were able to work with the city to alter the, the online application to include those fields. We were, one of the challenges we hit was that we had to switch that application a handful of times because as we moved in through the process, we would realize, oh, we need, we need, um, you know, we need a, this a slightly more specific information or we needed to have uh, not just professional skills, but uh, like labor, like 
there was need in the beginning for a lot of like sewing and things for um, masks and PPE, all the things that were going on there. Uh, so we did have to change that a few times, but we would then take the requests from the Council of Nonprofits and match them to the database of volunteers coming in through Silicon Valley Strong, which was strong, which was upward of the thousands after you know just a handful of months. We would then match them directly to the organization. We didn't facilitate anything beyond the sort of matching process, just given the crisis and the bandwidth of everyone involved. And then those volunteers would come back through the system to sign up again if they wanted to be placed again. So I know that the, this is like, a, there's a lot of arrows on this map, but all to say, the Council of Nonprofit was the primary communicator with nonprofit and public sector agencies. Then the Silicon Valley Strong Department was the primary liaison and communicator with collecting volunteers and, and matching them with food distribution and in-person opportunities. And then we were the primary organization matching the skilled volunteers. So we go to the next slide. Um, this is essentially a little bit more detail on what I was just describing, uh, the role of each organization. One of the things that we also were doing as things became a little bit more settled, probably around early to mid-summer, is that we were receiving um, requests from larger groups of volunteers, both kind of all three of us, the Council of Nonprofits, Silicon Valley Talent Partnership, and Silicon Valley Strong would receive requests from organizations who wanted to send larger groups. And so we would try to coordinate that as best we could, but it was always challenging given the distancing, the uh, physical distancing requirements. Next slide. Thank you. So like I said, we would receive all of the requests for volunteers, individual volunteers that had specific skills. The skills you see here are sort of some of the most common that I pulled out of our database uh, just this past week in planning for this. Uh, things like database management. One of the things that we saw is that some organizations were uh, sending out, let's say, laptops for distance learning, for, edu for education, K through 12 and above. And there were so many laptop donations coming in and so many going out to different places and organizations didn't have the capacity to, to have a database that was that quick and efficient to, to track all of those. So we would match those to people who could create those and frame those databases for them. A lot of requests for tutoring, especially around special needs. Translation was really big. Friendly callers and wellness uh, callers in various languages from different organizations. As we all know, we all switched to an online life. So there was a lot of requests for website development and even coding. Uh, we had a really interesting one that we matched with United Way and 211 because the, uh, the scale and the call volume that was coming in was, a, was quite a bit for their system and they were trying to add features. So we were able to find someone for that. Admin support at organizations, clinical psychologists, IT and tech support, and um, some interesting requests around food distribution and supply, supply chain management. So those are just some of the ones that stood out, but we had all various types of requests coming in. Next slide. So we would take that database of volunteer information from the application and we would try our very best to match it with the requests coming in from the nonprofits. Now, as Anna said so eloquently up front, and I was nodding my head, yes, communication needed to be crystal clear between both. So when a nonprofit would reach out to us to um, request of a specific volunteer. We used our, our former pro bono skills to help them really detail that scope of that project out so that when we sent that out to the volunteers in the database that matched the description of what they needed, it was crystal clear what needed to be done. 
um, so that both the volunteer and the nonprofit could identify whether that was a, a good fit. So uh, we found that if we weren't 100% clear, that role and the match with that volunteer was not as strong. Uh, they didn't maybe stick around or it wasn't the right fit after all, but generally we were able to make some strong, strong matches once we kind of realized the different categories of the scope that we needed to communicate, like the duration of the project, how, how many hours per week the project would be for that duration, the skills needed, a variety of different things that we pulled from uh, the nonprofits that we could pass on to the volunteers. Overall, uh, in the time period that we were doing this from May until September, we matched 35 individual volunteers to different nonprofit organizations and public sector. Uh, next slide. Um, I see a, a just a question in the chat that I'll address really quickly about vetting volunteers who work in sensitive environments, like with children. We had a couple of situations where we had tutors, et cetera, working with youth. Um, most of the time it was remotely, as far as I know. So we didn't have that, we didn't have too much vetting to do, but part of our intake with the nonprofit and helping them scope was always to ask them what were the requirements for the role for background check, et cetera, so that we were able to pass that directly onto the volunteers and ensure that that was something they either could, you know, could provide or could go through the, the training or certification, uh, you know, background checks to do that. Uh, so this is, I found very similar, our keys to success were very much similar to what Anna was saying up front about managing volunteers in general, which is very strong communication and relationships with your partners. We found we needed to have a really strong organization of our database because we had so many volunteers coming in and we were dispatching them, not just to uh, the virtual opportunities that were skilled, but also those same volunteers would also perhaps be interested and were often dispatched to in-person um, opportunities like food distribution. So we had to make sure that all of our numbers and IDs matched so that we weren't also tapping the same people <laughs> 10 times over uh, because we would get a certain number of requests, especially for translation and language. In the early days, I remember we found we were asking the same people quite a few times. So making sure that we were really well organized, helping define the scope, like I said, and keeping that uh, line of communication open throughout. So volunteers or nonprofits would be able to come back to us to troubleshoot different things that would go on throughout, throughout that experience. Next slide. Excellent. So the challenges, because it's not always easy. Um, the sharing of volunteer information between the city of San Jose, Silicon Valley Strong and ours was challenging because the city had an um, individualized database system that they used that we couldn't sync up with. So we had to do a sort of complicated version of exporting a CSV file, transferring it into our database, and then we would have to clean it up for our use, which wasn't ideal and I think is a way that we could think about improving to be prepared for the future is being able to keep all of that information in something that can be used between different partners uh, and getting those updated lists of volunteers because it wasn't something that we could access in the moment, the updated list, we would have to rely on the staff to send us those lists. We, we had a system where we got them once a week, but sometimes it was, it got spotty because of, you know, as you all know, the shifts in staffing around emergency management, um, or just there would be a crisis and, and someone would be able, wouldn't be able to send it that week. Making sure the scopes were clear and having that detailed vetting process was, was challenging, but possible. Um, we did have a lot of nonprofits once we were marketing this opportunity that were requesting skilled volunteers for things that weren't crisis related and having to prioritize those requests uh, was, was important. And because of our bandwidth, 
the metrics and evaluation was really something we never got around to. Um, we always had intended to and wanted to, but we, we weren't able to do it. So we weren't able to capture anything past the actual successful matching that we did. Um, and I think next slide, if I have another one, I might not. I don't have another slide for okay. you. Did I miss so, something? <laughs> no, no, I just, I, I've lost track. So I'm, tr I'm also looking at the chat. Um, who paid for the background checks. Everything was on, up for that was on the side of the nonprofit or the agency taking in the volunteer. Our role because of both liability and because of the sort of crisis, the, the way that it was set up was that we were purely matching and dispatching. We weren't facilitating any of the actual volunteer training or management um, beyond the, the development of a QR code system that was created for in-person volunteers for them to check in so that we could track the in-person volunteer rates of who was actually showing up compared to who was sent. Um, in one of my previous slides, you'll see, I think that the for in-person volunteers, they were up to about sending 50% more, 50 to 75% more volunteers to a shift then were requested to account for the no-shows. Um, and, and I think that's it, Ashley. That I'm it? gonna use uh, Dana's comment as a segue to our next speaker. Perfect. So, um, wonderful, thank you so much, Ashley, for sharing that. And folks, please feel free to add additional questions that come to mind in the chat box. I am tracking these on the side and we'll get these into our Q&A segment at the end of the, today's program. So thank you, Ashley, for that. And um, hopefully you'll stick around for the end of the Q&A as well. Um, and so the segue into our next program is actually a comment that Dana L. Neal from Silicon Valley Council of Nonprofits uh, put in the chat box for those of you who have that open. And that is that our Council of Nonprofits also matched thousands of volunteers to food distribution and to vaccine support over the past year and a half through the Silicon Valley Strong effort. So um, on to our next speaker, which is Diane Zapata. We are really pleased to have Diane with us today. Diane is the Director of Volunteer Engagement for Second Harvest of Silicon Valley. And I think we can all acknowledge that food was a huge issue um, for us all as worldwide, really. And Diane, as the Director of Volunteer Engagement, is responsible for ensuring a rewarding experience at Second Harvest um, for the many crucial volunteers who came out to assist. She built a team dedicated to continual improvement of the volunteer experience and oversaw the customization impl and implementation of Salesforce to support volunteers. Uh, she led her, uh, the, her team to navigate the COVID-19 pandemic. And um, as I think we all probably watched in the news, it more than doubled um, at the same time uh, that volunteers were sheltering in place and um, which presented some challenging dilemmas for organizations that had to scale up their volunteer needs very quickly. Uh, Diane has more than 20 years of corporate food service experience before joining the nonprofit sector in 2011. And Diane, a warm welcome to you. And I'm going to turn the program over now to you. Thank you, Anna. Um, and, and I just want to thank you for inviting me to be here. Um, I think hopefully you guys don't know who Second Harvest is, but if you don't, um, a short introduction. Um, Second Harvest was founded in 1974. And it's one of the largest food banks in the nation and a leader in ending local hunger. We distribute nutritious groceries through a network of more than 300 partners across our two counties. Um, and when I say we distribute it, we don't do it alone. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. Um, so next slide. Yes, Isabella, we are really uh, familiar with you as well. Um, you are a key partner to us. We'll talk about that a little later. Um, I tried to put more pictures in there than words because I thought that the pictures might speak louder. Um, so I wanna talk about what it looked like before COVID. So on the left-hand side, 
you can see we actually had a project called One Community where we were trying to figure out how to reach current and potential clients where they were. A lot of our effort was around the client experience. Um, and you can kind of see the result there. We had moved to a farmer's market style distribution where clients had the choice of what they wanted to take home. Um, so that required people to kind of walk through those stations and select the foods they wanted. And our food mix was mapped around the USDA MyPlate. 50% of what we distribute is fresh produce. And we also use a, a large purchasing budget to provide protein and dairy um, because those products are rarely donated. The photo on the right is what we call our orange room. This is the largest sort room that we have and our Cypress Center, which is our large volunteer center. And in this picture, you can see corporate volunteers working around totes of produce. They're doing a quality sort and we box individual um, pieces of produce at a time. So like full boxes would go out of plums, of apples, of oranges, et cetera. Um, and before COVID, about 80 to 90% of all of our food sort volunteers were from corporate groups. Um, they came in in you know, larger groups, two to three hour shifts. So this really fulfilled their needs for uh, philanthropy and for team building. So you can obviously see that this picture was before COVID, there's no masks. People are wearing gloves because we care about food safety but people were in close quarters around those bins. So if we go to the next slide, um, you're gonna see a little bit, and I, I realize it says after COVID. I realize we are not after COVID. I just wanted to show kind of the before and after. So I hope nobody takes offense to that. I put after COVID in there. Um, I know we're not in a post COVID world, but overnight, um, as you know, our volunteer workforce disappeared. Again, 80 to 90% were corporate volunteers and corporations sent their employees home, asked them to shelter in place. And not only that, they would not endorse or even permit their employees to come in and volunteer in their name. So we literally had cancellations overnight. So it, it was it was a, a really stressful time. In addition, we, of course, we supply volunteers out in the community and our food distribution volunteers a lot of them are retirees and they're in really vulnerable populations so many of those same folks pulled back from volunteering altogether so this really was a perfect storm just as employment and lives are being disrupted by this pandemic the need for food assistance was going up at the same time our ability to be able to meet that need uh, was a, a real challenge and I know in the past, all of our disaster training had been around spontaneous volunteers. Well, so all of our training and our preparation had been around how do you manage spontaneous volunteers in a time of a disaster? But we had never planned for the scenario where there wouldn't be volunteers. That was not something we considered. So, um, you know, what do you do? So we, we knew we were in new territory and we had to pivot. Uh, so the first thing that we recognized was that this farmer style farmer's market style distribution was not going to be safe in a pandemic. So in this picture, what you're seeing is you're seeing clients coming through a drive-through and you're also seeing volunteers. And again, you can see masked up and they are loading pre-packed boxes into cars. This was different than what we had done before. Again, farmer's market, we went to a drive-through. Um, this may sound like an easy thing to do, but it actually meant we had to change our distribution model completely. Instead of sending out pallets of each item, we had to send out combination boxes, which is very labor intensive to make happen. Um, so you can go to the next slide. And you probably saw on that earlier slide that uh, the need had doubled. We were serving about 250,000 clients before. Now uh, we went to serving about half a million every month. So what you're seeing here is the reality of what this new distribution model looked like. In order to do this, in order to go through drive throughs we had to retrain staff and volunteers. We had to create new roles. And yes, Aracel, you're absolutely right. That is St. Lucie's. I love it. <laughs> um, uh, so anyway, instead of having people manning food stations and clients coming through the line, we now had to work with car traffic. Volunteers had totally different role, roles. They had to do client check-in, traffic control, we had to have one volunteer in charge of opening and closing trunks or doors and another one to load the boxes in the vehicle. We were really concerned about cross-contamination and sanitation. I'm sure you remember in the early days, uh, we weren't really sure if it was 100% airborne or if it could be spread on surfaces. So we had to make a big shift. 
Um, and in addition to that, it meant that the workload shifted. Uh, it actually took less volunteers per client outside in the, in the community, even though we needed more volunteers there, but it required more food sort volunteers on the inside because to create those combo boxes, it's very labor intensive, very difficult to do. So here we need more work on the inside. And now we're also have to do social distancing. So uh, our warehouses certainly didn't grow in size, but it meant the same size could accommodate less people. So that was a real challenge for us. We had to actually set up conveyor production lines in places that were not desirable and places where volunteers um, either wouldn't work in that space or where it would not have been safe for them. We had to close our smallest volunteer location in San Mateo County because it wasn't large enough. And we actually had to set up production lines in our warehouses. So in the middle of trying to pull orders, they have a production line set up. So we had production happening at our Cypress facility in North San Jose at our Kurtner, which was a warehouse only facility. And we had to um, open a temporary facility and set folks up there as well. So the only way we could do this was really, it was because initially we got the guard to come in and the guard was placed only on the inside. And the reason you're not seeing pictures of conveyor lines is that the guard actually did not allow to have their pictures taken for security reasons. Um, so we relied on the guard in the beginning. And then eventually as time went on, we got funding um, to bring in the San Jose Conservation Corps we are relying on them still. Um, they're a, a really key partner for us and they've even been able to help us out in the community where we need help. Um, and at the same time, you know, we, we quickly adopted safety measures and got PPE. We struggle with supply chain issues like everyone else, but we tried to let our volunteers know that we are taking every safety measure possible so that we could bring them in. So if we move on to the next one, um, how do we do this? Well, it's through partnerships. I mean, the reality is that we do not do this work alone. We had to pivot and get really creative. And we learned that challenges can bring you opportunities. You have to seek them and be open to them. So in this picture, you're going to see on the right-hand side, this is, um, our Sally knows about this. These are folks from Catholic Charities. And in this picture, they're actually helping us with home delivery. We had explosion of need of home delivery. So that was another program that we had to scale. On the left-hand side, you'll see some volunteers from Team Rubicon. They were um, a key responder at early on in this crisis, but they're not the only ones, obviously, besides Team Rubicon and Catholic Charities, um, the Guard, San Jose Conservation Corps. We also had the Latter-day Saints um, step up. It turns out that these folks normally go out and do their mission every year. And because of the sheltered place, they couldn't. So they chose to do their mission at home and come and help us out. So, um, so anyway, we found opportunities like that to have explore partnerships that we didn't even see before. So I'll move on to the next slide. And this is really just to kind of show you the scale. This is only food sort, but I want you to see what the impact was. So FY20, this is the year that um, obviously COVID hit. And in orange, that is the number of hours, food sort hours per month by volunteers. So you can see um, what happened from March to April to May. I mean, it started to skyrocket. And now FY21, the yellow, that is our new normal. That is the level of production that we have to hit now just to be able to serve the community. So I thought this was a, a really interesting visual to kind of show you how much we had to scale we doubled in size, but honestly, as far as our need to sort food, it is about triple what it was before because of the combination boxes. And if you move on to the next one, um, that one is interesting. And this shows you, we have split it out between volunteer and what the Guard and San Jose Conservation Corps are doing. So the orange are the volunteer hours. And this is just this last fiscal year, which ended in June for us. But you can see how reliant we still are on the San Jose Conservation Corps. We don't have near that many guard. And we're already planning because it's a little scary to think how on earth are we going to be able to make that pivot um, once the Conservation Corps goes away. Um, this is going to be a really hard thing for us to figure out how to do with the existing space. So it keeps me up a little bit at nights, but I'm sure we'll figure it out because ultimately our clients need our help. 
So if we go on to the last one, I wanted to share this with you. It was a note from one of our home delivery clients. And I know you can't read it, so I'll read it to you. Um, to the wonderful agency service, thank you so much for the care packages. They are greatly appreciated. The food is wonderful, but even more so are the time and consideration from your volunteer work. Thank you again. Stay safe and be well. And, you know, little notes like this is what kept us going when it felt really, really dark. Even today, we're stabilizing at serving around 450,000 clients per month. So it has reduced a little bit, but unfortunately, we think that the need is going to be enduring and, enduring and the recovery is going to be slow. So I wanted to kind of end up with what I consider to be the lessons learned from this. Um, number one, I put down to be flexible and be open to changing your process. The mission doesn't change, but how you get there might. Um, number two would be ask for help and partner with others. We definitely can't do it alone. It takes a village. Obviously, I've called out our many partners. That's not exclusive, um, but these are our key partners, and we absolutely could not have done this without them. Um, number three, take this as an opportunity, and we did because without COVID, it could not have raised the awareness of local hunger in the way um, that we were trying to do by ourselves. So crisis can create opportunities. And because of COVID, we actually made some structural changes at our organization that were needed. And the crisis gave us clarity to do that. And we, are, we feel that we are stronger and better set up for the future. And the last one I'd say is embrace the new world. Um, part of this process was discovering that our clients love the drive-through model. 60% of our clients have reported that they prefer the drive-through experience. So that was a really great learning. So we know that at some point we're gonna end up with a hybrid model in the future. So that is my takeaways. And um, I just wanted to thank you all. Okay, thank you so much, Diane. You know, it was really interesting to hear kind of the behind the scenes of how things operated um, for Food Bank and, um, you know, just kudos to you and your entire team and your partner network. And our next speaker is actually one of your partner network agencies. Um, I'd like to introduce at this time, Araceli Gonzalez. Um, she is currently, she wears a number of hats. She is our acting cadre chair of our board of directors. She's a lifelong resident of San Jose and deeply connected to the neighborhoods and families that are served through Catholic Charities programs here in Santa Clara County. Uh, she is currently the program director and oversees a staff of 22 employees and hundreds of volunteers. And she is the agency's key coordinator for its COVID-19 food distribution program, which launched in March 2020. Um, one of the statistics she shared is that they are expected to reach 18 million meals uh, in September of 2021. Um, so that's what, well, actually, maybe she can tell us, did you meet, re, meet that? She's shaking her head. Okay, I'm going to turn the program over to Araceli, and thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you, Anna. And like Ashley and Diana said, pivot. Pivot was the word I believe we all used. Um, while everything was being put together, being part of Cadre, and I know everybody here on, on the call um, gets trainings from Cadre, but not only the trainings are valuable, but being part of a member or just being part of the meetings, um, that's exactly how it happened. Um, back in March, you know, it was the connections that we have through Cadre, sitting down with Bruno and sitting down with the CEOs and making those great connections from the very beginning on within the first 24 hours of what changes need to happen and need to happen fast. Uh, when I say need to happen fast, we, we converted the drive through distribution um, within 24 hours of closing, um, of, of being shut down, uh, in March of 2020. Um, so pivot. I'm here to give you guys another example of volunteers and where we might be able to gather volunteers. You know, COVID hit everybody. And when it hit everybody, um, we had to look at our own internal staff because we had staff that were, um, teacher's aides, we had staff that were working with kids, we had staff that worked out in the community, out doing um, outreach, different 
part of the community and now everybody had to stay home, shelter in place. Um, so that also affected a lot of our staff. So that's where we could look at our internal processes within, um, within your organization. If you had to shut down again, how would you use your own staff and your own resources? Because of the fact that we have trained staff that you know do workshops, trained staff that do um, assignments. Well, that's exactly what we did. When we converted um, all of the drive, all of our first, it was one, then we created nine drive-throughs and we're serving almost 10,000 families in one week within three weeks, thanks to you know, Second Harvest. Um, but that was a, a challenge. The group behind me, they are all stu they are all employees of Catholic charities. Um, because again, we were running from a hundred volunteers from the very beginning. And now, you know, I'm happy to say fast forward 19 months later, we have over a thousand volunteers in our better impact um, program that we that we have within, but we had to gain that just like everybody else. We had to reach those goals because of the fact that, you know, we had to use our staff, put implementations. And, you know, all of you guys are being part of this training today, but we also have trainings on command centers. We also have trainings on, you know, the EOC and, and, and how to set up an EOC. That's exactly what we did at most of our sites, whether it was a distribution, whether it was home delivery is, you walk in just like the EOC is you're provided an assignment, you're provided the instruction. Instructions are very key here. You have to give directions of, you know, for safety reasons. We didn't know um, in the early stage and within the first 24 hours, you know, who had to wear masks and how are we gonna get those masks and making those connections with Cadre, with Silicon Valley, with the EOC, making sure we had the proper PPE. Um, making those connections prior to a disaster is, is key. Um, so if you want to go to the next slide, please, Anna. Um, we, we, we definitely had to put a lot of those place. Working with Second Harvest, um, we had to look for different type of resources for, uh, for volunteers. We reached out to the parishes that were conducting churches, masses online. And we reached out to a lot of our parishioners. Uh, a lot of our parishioners that did volunteer prior to COVID were in that age that they couldn't come out. And you know, a lot of them got upset because they wanted to come out and support because that's who a lot, what, that's what they did. That was their everyday volunteer kind of style. Um, so you know, it took a while for them to actually come back to volunteer. And, to this day, you come out to the distributions and you have all ages. You have uh, kids from high schools. You have parents coming with their kids. You have seniors. Um, you have long-term volunteers um, and just tracking them. Um, also acknowledging them. I know within our Catholic Charities, because we are able to track all of our volunteers, we actually awarded all of our volunteers that have 100 and plus hours uh, with, within our system with their own best and their name of their best. It was just a, a little something, a little reward, um, but it goes a long way. Um, thanking, we, we constantly had all of our leaderships thanking the volunteers because we couldn't do it without them. You know, when we first stood up all of the distribution, it took anywhere from 50 to 65 volunteers to serve 800 families in two hours. Um, you know, Doing that in a safety environment, you have to have um, strict rules, I guess you can say, just like the ELC. You have to have assignments. If you don't have assignments, then you know that's when you know somebody's in, in has COVID. Then it trickles down to who was next to that person, who was next to that person. Um, being around um, a lot of people from different, um, some some people came out from. I know that uh, Second Harvest had the sharks come out. We had the earthquakes come out. We had different organizations. I know it took a while for organizations to start coming back and helping out because uh, a lot of organizations were shelter in place. 
And not until I want to say close to six months after shelter in place, did we start seeing trickles of um, organizations come in and try to volunteer as a group. And they wanted to do it in a safety that way they're protecting their families um, because they were still not going into the person in, in person to the to their offices, but they were going, they wanted to gather and, and try to do something. Um, so we definitely had to be, be pivoting. And tracking again, we have an or here with Catholic Charities, we have better impact and we're able to track, we're able to message anybody that signs up through our uh, through better impact. I remember one time we had to step up an organization that had to shut down due, a co due to a COVID exposure. But when an organization has to shut down due to COVID exposure, that means hundreds of people in, are gonna be impacted because they couldn't you know, provide the services. Um, we were actually, through the, or, through, through the Better Impact, we were able to send out the message to everybody and ask volunteers to come out within a 24 hour turnaround to set up this, this um, fast acting drive through And that's exactly what we did. Um, so it did help. Um, so, you know, I just wanna thank everybody and just remember to try to think outside the box. Um, not only are we trying to gain volunteers, but think within your organization, how you could pivot your own staff to help support or help lead while we're figuring things out. Okay, thank you so much, Araceli. And um, for those of you who don't know, uh, Araceli was uh, recently uh, awarded a very uh, wonderful distinction by Catholic Charities USA um, for the work that she's done here locally in our South Bay community to help uh, meet the food needs. And just as you heard, almost a tenfold um, expansion of one of our nonprofits to meet the COVID-19 uh, food needs. So I know that there's been just utterly amazing work done throughout all of our communities. And we highlighted just three of those programs this morning um, to show you a little bit of a sneak peek behind the scenes and learn from their expertise here, there, uh, kind of tips or best practices and lessons learned. And so um, at this time, I'd like to thank our COVID panel of speakers, Tori, I'm um, oh, sorry, Ashley, Diane, and Araceli for the amazing work that you all have done over the last 18, 19 months, and we know it continues. So thank you for that. And um, we're going to move on now to uh, our next segment, which is really looking at what about volunteering either that doesn't relate directly to uh, the pandemic. And so our next speaker is Rich Saito. Uh, Rich is retired from our San Jose, City of San Jose Police Department in December of 2006. He has then focused on public safety through disaster preparedness work. He's a member of the local community emergency response team here in San Jose's downtown Japantown area. He's a CERT instructor, a ham radio or amateur radio um, operator, and he also serves on the board of directors for our cadre organization for many years. And so with that, we asked Rich if he could please share a bit about a different uh, volunteer program and lessons learned from that uh, that went on just in the last few months. Rich? Thanks, Anna. Welcome, everybody. Uh, I'd like to just start off by thanking you all for your interest in uh, using volunteers for public safety. Uh, coming from a, uh, a you know a, a government organization, uh, if we need staffing, you know we just assign somebody. And we, we have a captive audience. Uh, since I've retired, uh, everything that I've been doing with uh, the CERT teams or the radios, uh, it's all been using volunteers. So we had the uh, pandemic start uh, earlier uh, last year and good old President Trump called it the China virus. And when he did that, we started seeing uh, anti-Asian hate crimes pop up all over the country. And in particular here in the Bay Area, San Francisco, Oakland, 
uh, in particular. Um, but being involved with San Jose's Japantown, there were a lot of people in our community who felt like they might be targeted for being Asian also. So in March of this year, we started the anti-Asian hate crime uh, safety patrol program called uh, Japantown Prepared Safe from Hate. Uh, Japan Town Prepared is the name of my CERT team, and the Safe from Hate part was a small separate program underneath the uh, auspices of not only the uh, CERT team, but the Japan Town Community Congress. So I'm talking to the uh, director of my board, uh, her name is Pam Yoshida, and we're looking at the news about all these anti-Asian hate crimes. And she says, you know, I saw an article in the news about the Chinatown safety patrols. It's called the United Peace Collaborative out of San Francisco Chinatown. I wonder if we could have something like that down here in San Jose, <coughs> excuse me. So I went up the next day and I met with Leanna Louie and Robert Lowe. Uh, they started a safety patrol program in Chinatown and they are out there every day. Uh, she's fortunate she runs her own business. So the San Francisco Police Department uh, puts out special patrols and uh, from the morning up till mid afternoon, and then Leanna and her volunteers take over from mid afternoon through eight o'clock at night. And again, they're out there every single day, and they're basically uh, out there to observe, record, and report. They want to monitor Chinatown. Uh, if they see something that's uh, you know a public safety hazard or illegal, they take a picture of it. And then if it's, it gets to the point where it's a public safety issue, then they go ahead and report it to 911 and the San Francisco PD. So the, the next couple of days, I attended a rally, an anti-hate rally at San Jose City Hall. And that was sponsored by Evan Lowe and Pam Foley from the City Council. We had a lot of speakers there. Mayor Licardo was there. A lot of the City Council members were there. <clears throat> so I got up afterwards and I said, hey, I'm thinking about starting the safety patrol program. I don't know what it's going to look like yet. Uh, but if anybody's interested in volunteering as a, as a citizen safety patrol, you know, come up and see me. So I had seven people sign up that day. <clears throat> now I'm thinking I can't run a, a seven day a week program like Leanna did with seven people. But the one person who was there who uh, really helped me is Robert Honda from NBC Bay Area, uh, the local uh, newscaster. So, you know, he, he you know, I know him. Uh, he interviewed me, and when he broadcast the segment uh, a couple days later, my email inbox blew up. I had over 300 emails from people all over the Bay Area who wanted to volunteer to help protect San Jose's Japantown. So oh, going back to uh, United Peace Collaborative, uh, Leanna Louie and Robert Lowe, they use Facebook to, to promote their program and provide updates to not only their members, but also the public at large. So social media was huge. They, they would not be able to do their program without that. And I wasn't able to get mine started without the help of the local media. <clears throat> So after uh, NBC Bay Area did their new segment, then I had people calling me from all over, all the major network channels. Uh, I got interviewed twice by Reuters out of London. Uh, I'm trying to figure out what is this about and what it was really the connection was that people saw what was happening to Asians all over the world and in particular in the United States. And they said, this is intolerable. Uh, you know, I feel sorry for them. Uh, I want to do something. Uh, so they stepped up. So out of the 300 emails that I had, I went through a process where I would, you know, interview them and train them, have them sign a liability waiver. And I ended up with 80 volunteers. Now I can run a program with 80 people. Uh, I used the uh, liability waiver that's based on United Peace Collaborative. It's a pretty much a standard document. And then I wanted it to be as ad hoc or as uh, much volunteer run as possible. 
So we set up a Google Calendar. And if anyone you know wants to go out and patrol, you know, we gave them access to the calendar. They enter their name and the hours. And so they, they self-record, self-assign, and uh, go out and do their shift, and then it's recorded. So with that, I was able, through my 80 volunteers, to provide over 600 hours of patrol time between March and the end of October when the program just ended. So we ended on uh, Halloween. Uh, we covered most of the week. Uh, we provided uh, volunteers with red vests, first aid kits, and whistles. And we had a lot of donations come in, uh, you know, unsolicited. We did have one, actually, and probably the greatest thing is that we've had no hate crimes in San Jose, Japan town. Now we did have one incident where a mentally unstable person pushed over two Asian females from our local senior uh, senior living facility. So in response to that, I gave an educational talk to all the residents uh, who showed up. There was about 45 residents who showed up. Uh, because of that, what, we, what I encouraged them to do, I said, you know, I cannot guarantee that we'll have a safety patroller uh, for you every day of the week, all the times that you want to go into Japantown to go shopping. However, if you uh, have a neighbor or a friend, it's kind of like, you know, when you go swimming, you have the buddy system. If you set up a buddy, uh, if you go down together and I ask them to be aware, alert and aware of their surroundings, they can increase their safety. So thankfully, we haven't had any attacks since then. Oh, go, uh, if you'd go back for just a second, please, Anna. Uh, we did have a conflict between a lay safety patrol person and a security person. Part of the vetting that I had to go through with the volunteers was to make sure uh, that they weren't there to train mercenaries. Uh, there are guys who said, you know, I want to, you know, go on there. And if one of those guys attacks us, we're going to take him out. And said, no, 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 I, I don't want you to do that. I just want you to observe, record, and report. <clears throat> we are also asked to provide uh, security for the Asian Pacific Film Festival, which was a, a couple of weeks ago. So that was in Sunnyvale. So we got actually asked to help out in the neighboring jurisdictions. Next slide, please, Anna. So we received about $8,000 in, in unsolicited donations. Uh, again, no hate crimes. Uh, we helped promote COVID, COVID vaccines uh, and herd immunity. And since all these things are kind of returning to normal, things are opening up. Uh, President Trump's out of office, thank goodness. Uh, stores, schools opening up. Uh, we decided to end the program in, at the end of October. So that was. Halloween, we had five or six volunteers out there. Uh, they closed the street. We had families, you know, in costumes, walking up and down, getting candy from the merchants. So it was a great way to end the program. Uh, we also had a couple of weeks ago, a, a volunteer and donor appreciation. Uh, we have an old house in Japantown. We went in the backyard. We're out in the open. We provided them with sandwiches and a t-shirt and a t-shirt had a graphic which looks like this. I don't know if you can see that. Can, they, can you see that, Anna? Not too well. It's a little bit fuzzy. But... A little blurry. Huh? Yeah. That's a, a picture of our UI Kai Senior Center and two of our volunteers. So that's basically how uh, our program started. It's very grassroots. It basically runs itself. Um, the, the key takeaway for the, the attendees in this, this webinar is if you have a, a cause that people can really relate to, uh, if you draw into the fact that you know, they want to contribute something, they want to help, and you get the word out to them through either social media or the news, they will come find you and they will come help you. And then it's just a matter of hanging on and you know, making sure like the other speakers have talked about, that they have clear uh, communications, expectations, and accountability. And it works out just wonderful. 
Okay. Well, thank you so much, Rich, for your wisdom and for your um, leadership on this important topic. And of course, the dog decides to bark right when I unmute my camera. He's been quiet this whole time. Okay, let's move on to our uh, last speaker, which I'm pleased to introduce, uh, Tori Woods from a program called Give to Get, which is a social impact company. And Tori has coordinated over 150 programs uh, with over 25,000 volunteers, including many global campaigns. She managed uh, an organizational pivot in response to the COVID-19 and reshaped the way community impact is achieved through employee engagement at in an at-home um, kind of program. And so I know Tori has some uh, remarks to share with you. Let me turn it over to you, Tori, thank you. Wonderful, thanks, Anna. And I'm sure my puppy here is hearing your dog and may go off as well, <laughs> so no worries. Um, but it is an honor to be here today. And I actually had the opportunity to speak um, briefly about this, about this time last year with Cadre as well. Um, so a little bit about give to get we are a social impact company. So I have the honor to kind of be the middleman between many of these nonprofits that are on today's call um, in the Silicon Valley area um, and corporations. So I'm providing some insights based on corporations and corporate volunteer programs. Um, prior to the pandemic, we had many in-person activations and what that looked like was we could, you know, go to perhaps the, the food bank and help volunteers, you know, facilitate a program or actually help to fix up schools. Um, but going back to our favorite word there, um, we pivoted with the pandemic and what that looked like were our at-home programs. So we have a warehouse um, and a team, and if you wouldn't mind going to the next slide, please, um, where we actually are able to support volunteer programs from the safety of their home. So as many of you know, corporations aren't, still aren't allowing their volunteers and, and employees to go out into the public on behalf of a corporation. So this was a, a very unique pivot um, and something that I know some of our partner organizations, such as the Hands-On Network um, and some other great nonprofit partners in the Bay Area also, you know, host similar programs. Um, so what we do is we assemble all of the items that a volunteer needs to, to, to give back. Um, these items are delivered directly to their home. We have a virtual component to it where the organizations are actually able to engage with the volunteers. Um, and then they take their time over the next week or so and, and put together their kit and their donations. And then we send them directly to the organizations. Um, just this last year, we have already had about 8,000 volunteers participate in this at-home um, program with about 3,000 more boxes going out uh, from now until the end of the holiday season. So it's been proven to be a huge success, you know, where we're able to support our, the needs of our nonprofit partners um, from, you know, from their homes. Um, most recently, we've been actually pivoting even more to a hybrid model where we are sending boxes to offices and different regions um, and at office opportunities to where volunteers can get together in smaller groups. So I'm going to talk about a case study that was done most recently with one of our clients in the Bay Area. Um, they are an electric provider, um, I will say, <laughs> um, and we they came to us with you know the the need to support one of their existing nonprofit partners, being the American Red Cross of Northern California, and I believe we have some representatives on the call. So hello, friends, <laughs> um, and what we kind of came to to realize was how can we 
identify the need without overwhelming the nonprofit partners. And I know, you know, Kadre had a similar webinar hosted on this and specific to how to manage those in-kind donations. But this is kind of a, um, an overview as to how we found a solution for it. Now, we understand that in-kind donations, you know, in the midst of an emergency can just be extremely overwhelming. Um, you know, even as you're, you know, passing out food or, you know, trying to manage all of the, the donations that are coming in with the actual in-person volunteers can be quite overwhelming. So the way in which we were able to do this with the American Red Cross was to kind of identify three different um, focus areas. Now, we're not able to give the immediate needs to different regions for you know, the, the fires that are perhaps taking place. Um, so let's get ahead of what it is that we do need. And because we're maybe not able to get in person and create an assembly line and you know, go to a warehouse and actually do something in person, this was an opportunity for our team to send the volunteers all of the supplies needed to actually assemble these kits. So the impact that we found with this case study um, were, you know, we were able to engage over the course of three programs, um, 150 volunteers. Now we estimate that it takes about two and a half hours for the volunteers to actually put together the kits, cards of support. Um, but with that, we were able to provide over $15,000 worth of in-kind donations through the fire relief kits that are handed out to individuals after a home fire. Um, we were able to assemble 250 veteran kits for veterans experiencing homelessness um, in correlation to Veterans Day. And then most recently, actually yesterday, we had five different regions that were in person at their command centers that were preparing 500 emergency preparedness kits that were handed out to local schools with those essential items um, that then they can continue to add to. So it's a, it's a way to you know, still be able to support while not overwhelming you know, the organization or creating more work for the organization. So, I do want to note, you know, some challenges and successes with this. Um, you know, we don't want to overwhelm our organizations, and I think that's one of the key, you know, findings and takeaways from these at-home programs. Is we work with very strategic partners, and you know, make sure that this is actually what you need in in response to emergency preparedness. So, you know, there's a limited need sometimes for those in-kind donations, and we understand that, um, or there's an ever-changing need. So we work with these organizations very closely to make sure that we are giving them, you know, the best donations possible. Now, one of the things that I found, and as many of your organizations probably have experienced as well, is the supply chain issues. Um, as we are coming into, you know, the holiday season and, what was great about that, it was a challenge and a success. You know, we were able to get in front of it so that we had these 500 kits for individuals that, you know, just had a home fire or were impacted by a home fire that could be stored, you know, for a um, month or two to come as needed because we are so backed up with the supply chain. Um, I actually work with the American Red Cross primary vendor and, they called me and they're like, you know, we're so sorry, we aren't able to get you these approved supplies because of the hurricanes that are happening on the East Coast or, you know, the, the supplies that we're sending to, to Haiti. So, you know, keeping that in mind as well is something that you really have to consider, you know, as you are preparing for emergencies and disasters. Um, some of the successes that came out of it, as I mentioned, over $15,000 of in-kind donated supplies and, and that exposure 
to over 150 volunteers and their families. Um, so this is, you know, a great way to through the virtual campaign and through, you know, the, the additional opportunities and information that we include in all of the boxes, you know, to educate these volunteers as to how they can be prepared and, and share the impact with their friends and families as well. Um, we did have overwhelming excitement and support from these volunteers and from this also came some in-person trainings um, with this client and the American Red Cross as well. So I also wanted to share some predictions from our experience um, with the you know, corporate volunteers in specific. Um, now we, we do anticipate these at home and at office models to, to continue. They're not going anywhere. <laughs> um, and, and that's great, you know, because we still have the need for the in-kind donations and also the monetary funds that likely come with support from a corporate partner. Um, we are seeing more and more of these hybrid models. So as Corporations are allowing their volunteers to go back to in-person. Um, sometimes there's very strategic regulations such as, you know, masks, socially distanced or vaccinations required from either the corporation or the nonprofit partner. Um, but, you know, we were able to offer sending some of the volunteers a kit that looks very similar to the in-person activation as well on site at your food bank or, or at your, you know, um, different organization and volunteer opportunities. Um, we are seeing some in-person volunteer events coming back. Um, I am actually traveling to one tomorrow, um, so it's really exciting. <laughs> but, you know, they, they are kind of slowly starting again. And even, you know, into Q1, we already have, I believe it's four or five in-person activations already planned for upwards of 600 volunteers. So that is something, you know, to, to start thinking about with your different organizations. What is that going to look like? What are you going to require? And, and what is the ask as well? Um, these, you know, events that support disaster preparedness will continue to be a challenge, but, you know, we need to get in front of them. And if there are opportunities that, you know, we can foresee, such as, you know, coming into the fire season, let's plan that out with your organizations to, you know, to ensure that we are ready to go with these in-kind donations. Um, and then again, you know, don't be afraid to connect with your corporate partners and to let them know what your needs are and, you know, how they can continue to support. I mean, it was amazing to see that Rich got, you know, $8,000 of unsolicited support um, or, you know, that there was food provided from, from unique organizations. So, don't be afraid, you know, to communicate, especially as we're coming into that end of year giving. And I will say many of them probably have budgets that they need to spend before the end of the year. So a nice little update as to what you're doing and, and um, what your ask is will always be helpful. So kind of recapping a bit, you know, these in-kind donations for um, emergency preparedness can be difficult, um, but there are solutions and ways in which you can partner. Um, and we'd be happy you know, to provide some more context to that and, and what that looks like as well for your organization. All right. Thank you so much, Tori, for sharing that, um, that information with all of us. Um, Tori's information uh, to connect with her is on the screen for the moment, and um, she can also put it in the chat box. I know we did have a, a request to get in touch with you um, to see if there are other programs that could connect with you. Uh, so you might see some messages coming through the chat to uh, direct with you. Let's move on to our um, Q&A segment. There have been a couple of questions in the chat, and I'm going to uh, ask you guys, you can either put your question into the chat or you can use your raised hand feature uh, in your Zoom panel, and we'll call on a couple of you for questions. Um, Sharon Leon with uh, California Office of Emergency Services. Let's start with you. You had entered a question. Hey, thanks, Anna. Hey, Rich, I have a question for you. I'm intrigued by your program 
mainly because it is a people to people interaction and and I'm thinking that can also be very challenging for some depending on who they are. So I was wondering um, since folks were out on the street um, and with the anti-Asian hate um, climate that was there, was law enforcement, um, were you connected with law enforcement on that volunteer program and, and were they aware of what was what the program was doing on the ground? That's a great question, Sharon. Um, you know, I probably could have done a better job with that, but initially, no, I didn't tell them. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a reserve officer, so I, I have the connections with the San Jose PD, but I thought, you know, this is a, a grassroots, all volunteer uh, safety patrol monitoring thing. It's not really law enforcement. So I didn't tell them. So after all this press blew up, they, they got a hold of the uh, PIO at the police department and said, hey, do you guys know about this? They had no idea. They disavowed any knowledge or, or uh, relationship with us. But right after Chief Mata was appointed chief of police, uh, he came down with his command staff and I gave him a tour of Japantown. And when I showed him what the community was about and our safety patrol program, you know, he said, hey, whatever you need, I've got it. So he assigned a area commander, Lieutenant Ken Tran, to act as my liaison. So when we have the little incidents occur, like the guy that pushed over the females, I get a hold of Lieutenant Tran and he says, okay, we'll arrange for you know these special patrols or we'll do the follow-up investigation. So, you know, it, it's everything kind of fell into place. Uh, anytime, <laughs> if I do this in the future, I'm gonna make sure that the, the government agencies are informed. Uh, I did not work with OES, which was the other question you had. Very good, uh, but it, it didn't really fit in with uh, what we were doing. I hope that answers your question. Well, uh, just a follow-up question: Were were folks just driving through, or were they walking the sidewalks? Uh, I actually had people on foot and on bicycles. Oh, okay. Yeah, so they all had a red vest. I don't know if you could see it on the flyer, but uh, they were wearing those red vests. Yeah, I can see that. Mess. So. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, Sharon. Okay, so um, I'm not seeing any other questions entered in the chat box, and I don't see any hands raised, but feel free to um, do so and raise your hand, unmute yourself if you have a question, or put it in the chat box. I'm going to move forward with our last five minutes of a couple of closing comments and telling you guys what else is coming up next, uh, keeping us on time. So, um, Araceli and Rich, if you'll keep monitoring the chat box for me. Um, I am going to launch a poll right now. Our funders do require us to gather some participant feedback. Um, but what you have on your screen right now before I hit uh, the Zoom poll is our next session is coming up in two more weeks. It's on November 16th, and it's going to focus on CBO and government coordination, um, particularly for our South Bay communities of Monterey, Santa Cruz, and San Benito County. So if you're joining us from outside of Santa Clara County, feel free to um, go to our training calendar on our cadre website and um, go ahead and register for that session. I'm hitting the poll now so you can give us some feedback. Uh, there are also um, two upcoming um, what we call, oh, actually, sorry, one more, one more session. There is a session on um, long-term recovery that is being led by our North Bay uh, partners uh, in at the Center for Volunteer and Nonprofit Leadership based out of Marin. And so if you want more information on the long-term recovery for nonprofits and faith-based communities, you can go ahead and put your message in the chat and I'll make sure that you get this flyer and that it's posted to our website as well. The uh, last uh, opportunity for you to uh, connect with us through this particular grant funding stream is what we call technical assistance open forums. Uh, starting this Friday and for the first Friday in December, we're going to have an open forum where if you are doing planning for your nonprofit or faith-based organization and you have some additional questions um, or you're experiencing some challenges, 
or you want to share a particular best practice or success with us and your colleagues, please join us on Friday, November 5th or Friday, December 3rd. And um, we have an open forum. Think of them as kind of like open office hours. You can come in. There's not going to be a set presentation or program. We're going to open up the session and allow you all to speak with one another, speak with us and uh, any of our team from the different nonprofit collaboratives and our um, leadership. And with that, we are at 1027. Um, I'm not sure if there's any additional comments. You're welcome to come off mute at this time. That was, um, you know, our program for today. When you exit your Zoom uh, session today, it will give you an opportunity to give us some narrative feedback in addition to the Zoom poll on anything you particularly liked, any suggestions for the future, any suggested other workshop topics you'd like to see us offer in the coming new year for 2020. And so with that, um, I'd like to offer a big round of applause to all of our speakers and presenters today. Yes, Holly, uh, the presentation is recorded. It'll be available online. Uh, give us a couple of days, hopefully by the end of the week, and if not by Monday, um, that'll be posted to our Cadre website. Rich, can you put the URL in the chat for us? Um, so everybody can quickly get to the Cadre website. Um, it's www.cadresv.org, and there's a preparedness tab at the top with a drop-down menu for all of the different preparedness topics and resources. And then at the very bottom, there is a, a drop-down menu for webinars. That's where you'll find them kind of in topical or chronological order to find the recordings if you're not sure where to look in the upper tab. And um, so with that, thank you everyone for joining us today and for your work in our community to harness what we hope is the powerful force, not the chaotic force of volunteer resources in our community. Thank you.